Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is Parnell McGuinness, who, amongst other things, is a columnist with the Sydney Morning Herald and the Sun Herald, and also runs a strategic communications company. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. Thank you. Parnell, your whole family background is involved, sitting with your father's work, P.P. McGuinness, in fighting for liberalism or for liberal ideas. How do you understand liberalism to be? What, what is it? Two, two big questions there. First of all, what is liberalism? Look, in its purest form, I'd say it's the, the notion that individuals should be able to live and act freely in accordance with their conscience. And I think also that there is an aspect of adherence to the rule of law, so uh, a certain a certain concept of equality within it. Um, you mentioned my family background and, and the tradition of my father fighting for liberalism, and I'd just add in there that you, you shouldn't forget that he started off on the communist side of the spectrum mm. and travelled across it, and this is relevant to this discussion in the sense that What he said to me once when we were discussing that, when I asked him, why was it that you started off on that side of politics and ended on the other side? And he said, well, I still believe in the same outcomes. I just believe that the way of getting there is different to the one I originally thought. So he originally thought that the best way to achieve human flourishing was through a communitarian communal approach, communist approach. He then, in the course of his life, discovered that, no, in fact, the best way of getting there was through a liberal approach, in his opinion. Now, I'm not interviewing him, but you, so I don't want to get you to try and channel uh, your father, but what was it about liberalism that you think led people like him, and there are others also have done that journey in the late late 20th century, to that journey from what was very attractive to uh, to many progressive people, to realise that was actually a false end, false means rather. I think that was the evidence of their own eyes. That was, of course, the the communist era. And when you see communism in action, you see this very cohesive ideology which takes you through its cohesion not to a place of greater equality but because of its ideological and uncompromising application to a situation in which apparatchiks govern the world. And just to give us the next sort of tab in this conversation, of course, I think that's what you're seeing in liberalism at the moment as well, is that it has become such a cohesive and overbearing ideology in the way that it's applied by some people that it has taken us to a position where we are no longer questioning or no longer nuancing the system to be, a su- to be suitable for human beings. Rather, we are trying to create what Mencken called a clear, simple and ultimately wrong answer. <laughs> yes. Tell me more. You think liberalism itself now has become ideological in that, in that out-of-touch way for, in some places, out-of-touch with human flourishing? Yes, yes. So I, I think that oh. liberalism through, when it is applied in this notion of complete freedom, ultimately leads us to ignore that many of human human structures are built around the happiness that and um, an importance of connection between people. So the culture that um, that gives us responsibilities to one another, so to from parent to child, from child to parent, through the generations to one another in a um, through traditional setups, is so important to us as as a species, that trying to liberate ourselves from that entirely is actually a bit of a, 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 a go, is taking us in the wrong direction. So what has happened is that by pushing this, this very, very simplistic liberalism, we have moved away from, we've forgotten what's so important about the things that, that unite us. And I think that's also why we are seeing people responding, people sort of rejecting liberalism. They, they feel betrayed by what they say. It's either an economics, economics of liberalism, even if they're social liberals, or they think they're betrayed by 
uh, by globalization when they are locally based. In fact, what they're being betrayed by is this sort of very ideological approach which forgets that everything in humanity is nuanced and that we need to we need to bear in mind our our connections to one another even while we work towards a better a better future together. Can you think of any, any examples of the kind of um, this liberalism, extreme liberalism that that, uh, that that you think are turning people off? You've mentioned globalisation. Any, anything else in your mind when you think of this? I, I do, but it's sort of a little bit difficult to describe in a way. So a lot of the uh, a lot of social systems. I mean, we we give ourselves this freedom from. Um, responsibility to one another. We give us, we give ourselves freedom of relationships and freedom even from from social constructs of marriage, for instance. I mean, this is a marriage is a great one. Charles Murray spoke about this a lot. Um, people liberated the the, 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 the 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 American social researcher Charles Murray. Yes, yes. sorry, a big one. We liberated ourselves from this tradition of marriage, and that's a wonderful. A wonderful moment in history because it was really important. It had become an overbearing institution for women. It had also become an institution which was dysfunctional in many ways for for many people. There was too much riding on this institution. However, when it was dismantled, it was dismantled so thoroughly and so ideologically that people actually lost a really important a really important structure and and part of their lives. So what that's led to in many ways is, first of all, we see the great unhappiness that many people have from never moving on to the next stage of their lives. Ironically, this seems to happen to men, even though it's women, you know, women have a very strong biological step from, from one part of their life to another and from that part of their life to it's too late. Whereas Men don't have this and there is a great sense of loss but they cannot figure out where it's coming from. There is no impetus to move from um, adolescence into the next stage of life responsibility and so therefore there is no, there are no markers in some men's lives which tell them to, to take the important steps which, which ultimately lead to great happiness and satisfaction yes, in life, even yes. though they, they may be miserable or sometimes uncomfortable and, and unpleasant along the way. And believe me, I've had a toddler too. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I think it's really important that, that we think about, um, you know, liberalism has freed us from, from many things, but, we, but it's also freed us from thinking about, um, about the concept of, of connection with one another. And as Charles Murray pointed out, what, what wealthier people in societies have done is they have started to realise this again and they've started to re-enter the, the institution of marriage and, and take on those life steps again. Um, but because of this philosophy of liberalisation, of, of liberalism as opposed to being liberal, which... Um, Society is now structured to encourage people who don't recognise that as a as a higher good, who haven't understood that that there is a that there is an end game in life in the way that you move through it. Um, that's encouraged them to to take a, quite a zigzagging path, which leads to a lot of people being quite disconnected and unhappy. Yeah multiple divorces, you know, things which which actually don't, you know, which which sell themselves as being part of a free life but end up in in people sometimes feeling very disconnected from society. Am I right? Liberalism at its most extreme promises that everybody just does, chooses the, the highest goal is human choice and freedom. And if everyone just goes free and chooses things, whatever they want, it'll all turn out well in the end for them and for life. In other words, there's a remarkable optimism and perhaps I might say a narrow point of view about what, about the power of choice that's to be right. the, uh, the great energy of human life and flourishing. Or, or uh, the, the that's choice, plainly unrealistic, you're saying. That's, well, or that choice, because the problem about choice is not choice per se. Obviously, you know, we no. can choose to take on responsibilities which ultimately lead to a satisfying life or we can choose not to take on those responsibilities because in the moment they are hard. We can choose freedom from them, 
but we but we without the structures of tradition that once told us you know the the religious structures or the societal structures that once guided us through through life they no longer lead to the satisfaction these choices are short term decisions and that's that's i guess the the problem which has which has crept into liberalism is this notion that um that there is that freedom is the ultimate path to happiness rather than rather than the choice to take on to take on bonds and responsibilities freedom in itself rather than freedom to choose the good yes yes exactly but anyway i'm rob forsyth this is liberalism in question and my guest today is panel mcginnis and we're discussing some of the limitations of liberalism having gone too far i don't know if you've been to many school speech days no doubt you will have to when your children are old enough but a common theme i've often heard is the statement fulfill your potential be who you want to be have you heard that phrase as a kind of moral advice uh, to young people a view of a philosophy of life for what i'm hearing you saying panel i think you're saying that is inadequate i i think it's inadequate um and it's and it's also misleading i mean the choice to be whoever we want to be doesn't stand open to everybody um the uh, the choice to you know there are there are simply a number of people who who are blessed with certain qualities and and others who aren't so um i think that that this choice this complete sort of di- divorce from from all obligation or from this this sort of ultimate promise of anything means that there is a void ahead of yeah. people which which is full of nothing they have to fill it with something and not everybody is capable of filling that void it becomes basically a nihilist view of the world un- unwittingly nihilist that's right that's right and in fact martin gurry um who's a former cia analyst and has written a very interesting book the revolt of the people sees a lot of um sees a lot of the current nihilism in society arising from this from this notion that that the government promises ultimate freedom and in order to facilitate that the government promises that gives you welfare and structures and um and and all kinds of supports to make that happen but the government can't fulfill that promise which it has provided all of these services to do by with the ultimate goal of them all which is the happiness that comes out of it and he says the reason that he says the street protests and the um the the discontent in society as rising from a generation which has been made which has which has had all kinds of promises made to it by government which it simply can't cash the checks on so ironically it's government that ter- it turns out to be the uh, solution or or rather the that to which people look in this hyper liberal world yeah well that's, that's what, what an irony that what an irony that is <laughs> well indeed and in fact that's very much denine's point in the, in why liberalism fails so yes. he's a very interesting thinker who who i have problems with as well as agreeing with him on a lot of things but but Deneen's point is very much that um, that in in replacing all of these freedoms with laws, so in replacing sorry, I beg your pardon, in replacing traditional structures with laws, you end up with a much more invasive government than mm. you would if you had um, if you had the old traditional structures, and you actually end up with people having less freedom and more homogeneity. So very interesting thesis about how. How sort of the search for ever more freedom ends up in in less and less. Does this mean that for liberalism to survive and and to thrive and to be, it needs a moral base of some kind. It needs it needs a, a view of humanity and of of living that's not just choose whatever you like. Um, you mentioned the past. There were these moral underpinnings in Western society, but they're under a great deal of challenge today. In fact, they're, they're being thinned out today our moral discourse is much thinner than it was can we get it back i think we have to try um and i think that the first step in this is also to stop 
regarding liberalism as an ism or to, to move away from that ideological logic of liberalism. We have a, philosoph a philosophy of liberal behaviour and a sort of a liberal worldview. And it's so important that, that those sort of tenets of liberalism don't become systematised into something which rejects the very nature of humanity. So essentially what I'm pleading for is don't, let's not make ideologies out of things. Humanity never lives well by ideology. Yes. Communism was an ideology with a, with a lovely end game which takes a terrible, terrible path through its systemization. And liberal philosophy has done the same. When it became liberalism, it took a wrong turn, which has brought us to a point where we're not really quite sure how we're going to bring back the humans into humanity, into the human society and structures. Although, uh, and this may be a slightly Marxist point I'm going to make, <laughs> economic change also have driven the, some of these changes in people's thinking and behaviour. I'm thinking of, of uh, globalisation has been enabled by technology. I'm thinking of a number of changes from the Industrial Revolution, which, which have pulled people out of traditional culture in, mm. into, into this massive world in which um, the challenge of pluralism uh, has really been both a, an opportunity for liberalism, but in a sense what liberalism has depended upon and have grown out of. Yes. Uh, but Not, I just, not think, just ideas. I don't see it really as pulling it out of context because in a way that's, that's humanity. When we set sail across the oceans, we didn't right. leave culture behind ourselves. We created new culture. You know, humanity is a is a constant process of of, of discovering new things and integrating new ideas. Um, and the liberal idea is, you know, is one of those ideas that that humanity has has discovered and has integrated. And indeed, as you say, globalization, the these um, these technologies. These things have been a massive boon to humanity. We've become incredibly wealthy and we've made all of us wealthier through these technologies. So I don't think we should reject these directions. What we simply need to do is not push ourselves into this, not, not constantly come up with these grand ideas and try to live up to them um, because this grand idea is just, we are not perfect human beings. We're trying to re we're trying to create these big, simple ideas which absolve us of constant thought and constant inter iteration. And humanity cannot do that. We need to think. We need to iterate. And there is no perfect, simple system by which we can sim by which we can abdicate responsibility. Not religion. Not liberalism. Not communism. Nothing. Show a suspicion of meta narrative to use the postmodern phrase. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perhaps, perhaps. Looking around, I don't think liberalism is is under great criticism, as you just pointed out. Um, what are people trying to put in its place, as you understand it? And is that is that itself another one of these dangerous ideological structures that that deny some of the complexity of human life? Yeah, I think so, and I think you know some of the. So obviously one of the backlashes that we're seeing at the moment, as I mentioned before, to, to liberalism is, is this uh, turn back towards the notion of communism. Um, communism, you know, having never been tried properly, as we famously know, you know, and um, but we're also seeing people looking at liberalism not, and... Not, and not real communism, surely. Not, not real communism. But then, you know... Even, as a, as, as Mr. Howard, as our former Prime Minister mentioned on an earlier version of this um, of this podcast, real liberalism appears not to have been tried properly either. In fact, uh, uh, I think that's, I'm as you know, I, in my other life, I'm a Christian minister and we say the same about the Christian faith. So we're all busy saying that wasn't us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And to my point of imperfection, you know, humans aren't good at perfection. Um but uh, but one of the one of the trends that I'm concerned about at the moment in the backlash against liberal ideas or liberal philosophy yes. is that there is a sort of a push back towards religion, but towards imposing a type of religiosity on humanity that uh, will again be an ideology, a system. You know, if there is one thing I think that we can conclude from history. It is that whenever humans try to create God where, where they believe God has gone missing, instead what they do is create Mao. 
Um, so they could they put a dictator or a dictatorship in that place. And that's a big danger, I think, because I think that there is a sort of nostalgia towards religion at the moment rather than um, an attempt to discover meaning within oneself and within one's community again, which can sometimes lead to these shared beliefs. I must say I agree entirely. Any attempt for humans to create heaven always creates hell. There's no question about that. Do you you mean by this term religion in the West or are you thinking about militant Islam or, or... or nationalist uh, Hinduism? Where, 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 where do you see West, this? Certainly in the West. Certainly in the West there is there is in the moment in the backlash against the liberal philosophy, and you do see this in Deneen and you do see this in another very interesting thinker of the tradition, Rizad Lagutko, who wrote The Demon in Democracy. So there are these, these great philosophers um, thinking about the issue of, of the problem with liberalism at the moment. And where they are seeing the solution is in the need for more tradition, the need for more religion. Now, I'm not accusing either of these philosophers of doing this, but some people then once again like to find that clear, simple and wrong answer and say, okay, well, if that's what we need to do to move away from this solution then or move away from this problem, then we need to... Um, we need to get God back into this and we're going to put him there by hook or by crook. So uh, this is not a liberal, you're thinking of what's called integralism, where in a sense the state takes a, a view, a religious view, that, 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 the, that they're longing for a good old day with crown and altar, that's, which did exist, which did there, exist in, uh, in Europe. That. There is a push for that wow. in conservatism, in, in conservative wow. So, So, I mean, you know, that is, that's one of the dangers that, that we always come up against. Whenever, whenever one of our great isms fails, there's a big push in an opposite direction, which, as you say, leads equally to hell. Because uh, I'm, although my tradition was of an established religion which imposed religious belief on society, at the time it seemed natural, with hindsight, it must mean you become a persecuting uh, state. And just as illiberal, in fact, liberalism often grew out in reaction against a persecuting state. Uh, And Although I must say, Parnell, I'm not sure I see in Australia strong moves in this direction, maybe in the United States or Europe, but not here in Australia. Well, I mean, everything always starts small. I like to, I like to, um, to read widely and and catholically if i may say so um you know and, and yes there is definitely a movement in in the us um it being a larger society with more thinkers um yeah. but there are also people picking this up in australia i'm i'm sure there are also in non-english speaking countries are you worried about the uh, the, the kind of remoralization of our society with great conser- great moral concerns i've noticed in um certainly in, in the amongst progressive society, uh, concerned about racism, sexism, and almost a, a new utopianism developing, a desire to get it really, really right, uh, to abolish things. I remember someone saying the government should act so we can, what's it, we can blot it, we can prevent ever again there being any of this kind of, um, was about domestic violence. Mm-hmm. A, an idealism, hung, hunger for that in our society. Do you see that as any way a danger, a kind of, perfectionism of moral concerns? Well, yes, especially if it doesn't start with the self. So the moment people start by by deciding that they're going to improve others rather than start by looking <laughs> at how they can improve themselves, we're always heading down a dangerous route. And, in fact, I, I thought I was, I wrote recently about this um, following the criticism of Jordan Peterson because yes. now, I'm no huge fan of Jordan Peterson, I have to confess. I, I think his writing's a bit overblown and, and his thought is not always as as, as complex or interesting as, as I think people sometimes make out. But he does make a few very important points. Among those, that you should clean up your own room before you seek to go out and change the yes. world. Um, and by contrast, so the um, there are movements like the Robin DiAngelo White Fragility book, Mm. which was written against racism, you know, or not against racism, but in favour of anti-racism. Um, And always, these books always seem to look at how how people can change other people, how people can tell other people that they are doing the wrong thing. 
Now, rating anti uh, not anti fragility, rating white fragility, yes. Yellow, white fragility. Um, one of the one of the things that becomes very clear in this text is that she herself she feels that she herself is racist. And there is this great struggle with her own inner inner ideas and and conflicts. But rather than look first to how she can address these within herself, she starts off by how can we change society? Now, she also does very well out of this financially, so um, <laughs> good on her. Uh, but but this is this, these are the two poles now also, I think, in politics. And this is what we see in this in in a lot of progressive idealism tends to be let's change the rest of the world and there is very little look at uh, what are the failings within myself, you know, am I yes. am I in a position, am I perfect enough to be going out and telling other people how to be perfect? Parnell, there's something of a, of a Burkean conservatism underneath your liberalism, I feel, a awareness of the limitations of human uh, ability to have systems that will make things better, whether the left or the right, and a need, a need to be aware of the both, I guess, our lack of knowledge and our lack of power uh, to make things perfect for ourselves and acknowledge the reality of human, the deep reality of humanness. Uh, am I understanding you correctly? Yes, absolutely. I'm a I'm a big fan of Burke. I think that I think that there is very little that that couldn't be solved at the moment by going back to some of Burke's ideas and perhaps also to some of Adam Smith's ideas. So there's a very interesting. Again, I read a lot, but the very interesting book recently by Jesse Norman, who was out in Australia mm. a while back, and I think CIS may have hosted him as well, um, called uh, Moral Capitalism, I think it is. Um, but he marries the the Adam Smith and Edmund Burke traditions to look again at how can society find back to some of these important traditions of, of a healthy capitalist society based in the knowledge, self-knowledge of human beings not being perfect and and looking always to the to the past as well as to the future for how yes, to move yes. sensibly forward. That's been fascinating. Thank you very much. There's so much more that we could explore uh, in this debate, in this discussion. Thank you very much, Parnell McGuinness. This has been another podcast of Liberalism in Question from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been the independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.